Recording is on. Happy oh, she's you. back. She's back. Yeah. Funny lady with the vac- with the with the swing oh, yeah. Glad to glad to see you feeling good, Matthew. I'm still actually not 100 percent well. I'm still coughing, and I'm going to get my lungs scanned and stuff like that. Nothing really serious, but just can't can't get rid of it, you know. Mm. So, but I'm I'm seeing a specialist now, so I, I, it's getting in hand. So that's cool. Nothing to worry about, but it's just a bit irritating. Glad to hear it. How about you, Joey? How have you been? It's been a while since I've seen you. Good, I know. Um, a little bit of travel and um, other kinds of things. Uh, good. Just uh, excited to hear everybody and sort of move our stuff forward together a bit more. So, yeah. yeah. yeah last time we spoke, you were actually you were calling in from Bucharest or was it Bulgaria that, was or somewhere. It that far back? Wow. Yeah, it was that far back. Yeah. And that was when I was asking, you know, this pilot project, Massive Wiki thing, does it? Is it, should it be, you know, where should it be? Where should it, where should it be? Uh, how does it sort of position as with respect to fellowship and OGM? Because I'm so new to this space, you know, I just don't know where to, where it begins. Cool. Uh, shall we check in that way? Sure. Well, Since well. it says so on the agenda, I mean, heck. We've got an agenda. Uh, um. We have uh, high tech note taking capacity, the whole thing. Mm. Um, so uh, let me just let me just sort of uh, catch up for a second because la- um, a couple interesting things. Uh, last week I was at the Linux Foundation's annual member summit all week for two funny reasons. Uh, one is April gave a speech there, a keynote speech on Tuesday, and I was not going to go with her. Uh, but we know Brian Balendorf, who's been a member of the foundation, is part of the birth story of Apache and a bunch of other things. We've known him for years. So she wrote him a note saying, hey, uh, did you have anything to do with my getting the speaking engagement? And he said, nope, didn't go through me at all. Uh, but is Jerry coming? And she said, nope, not planning on coming. And he said, oh, he should totally come as my guest. So so then we made plans and I, I, I went. And then uh, he thought about it for a second and he is now running the Open SSF which is about open source supply chain security. Open source supply chain security. So uh, yes, all yes, you yes. Know, K- Kubernetes and packages and all the layers of software. And if you think about it, somebody says, oh, I have an open source app you should try, but you have to load this library, this library, this library, and this library. And like, you know, g- good luck getting all the right versions of all the right pieces. It's that. It's a bunch of other things. So he had a board meeting on Friday that he asked me to help facilitate. So I did that with him. Which was really fun, but it was. It, it, but I, I'm checking in with that because it was really, really interesting for me personally, and for me thinking about all these all our projects together to marinate for a week in people leaning in forward heavily into open source, even people from J.P. Morgan Chase and other places where you'd be like, hmm. But uh, but it was great, and uh, Pete's heard me check in a little bit about this on a couple of other calls this week, but. Um, I was also highly impressed with how many open source projects are in the basket of of the Linux Foundation uh, and how well they seem to be doing. I mean, there's just a lot of very productive work there. So it was a great role model, but a little daunting because these things get get huge when they're really working. They get huge and they involve a lot of coordination and funding and other sorts of stuff. Um, So that was great. Um... And I'll check in more maybe later as other things get triggered from memory. But who else would like to check in? Peter? You're muted for some yeah, reason. Yeah, even yeah. better. Oh, there we go. I, thought it was a, um, I have too much going on to, to figure out what what's going on. Exactly. Um, Are your headset's working again. That's good. Yeah, that's good. Um, uh we had we have um thinking tools map project meets at uh, massive wiki um two hours earlier than this <clears throat> uh so we had another good uh call uh today talking a little bit about project says we haven't gotten a lot done um but we decided that we would kind of expand since I started it last week anyway, um, expand the kimono a little bit uh, and invite folks in, um, fellowship and link folks in a, a little bit more than, than we have been. Um, uh, before we do kimono. that, what's that? Expand the kimono, you said? It's a yeah. mixed metaphor, but still. <laughs> 
Um, I'm I could ex- that. What's that? I'm linking that. <laughs> It's, be, it's because we've gained weight. We have to expand the kimono. Oh, um, I'm kidding. It, uh, is, yeah. No, really, that sounds like it should be. Actually, what, no, it means, but I'm, what, I'm, what does that really mean? Yeah. <laughs> uh, there's a um, uh, there's a term I know from uh, vent- venture capital, but it it happens also in financial um, financial businesses and stuff like that. Um, opening the kimono uh, to a close partner is like. Um, I'm going to let you peek inside our business uh, a little bit. It's a bit of a racy um, kind of term. But... It is a little racy. Yeah. It's also kind of uh, um, a, a little bit uh, racist um, because yeah. the same organizations also have Chinese walls. Um, Chinese walls are where you live on both sides of the wall, but um, you pretend not to know about the other side at all, uh, depending on which one you, you're in. Um, anyway expanding come on a little bit uh, the uh, uh w- what we're going to do is probably take a week to uh amongst the three of us get a little bit sen- better sense of uh, what we were trying to do a, a more consolidated sense of what we were trying to do with the project and why and and then uh we'll have a a touchstone um as we talk to more people and and, and you everybody's got great ideas and and we'll have a better way of saying yeah, that's outside the scope of what we were thinking, or no, that's a great addition to what we were thinking. So that's kind of our our next this this week's work. Thank you. Chris, we're just checking in, mm. and maybe Matthew Chris? should go next. Oh yeah, yeah. Okay, well, it's nice to be nice to be back in this meeting. I can't usually make it this time, but uh, Peter mentioned a couple of hours ago at our massive wiki meeting that you spilled the beans about our top secret project so i thought i'd just check in and make sure that uh you know i'm not i just wanted to say hello to be honest and find out how much you know how much interest there might be because we see that at a certain point we wanted to start expanding the number of people who are involved in a sort of series of concentric circles and you're the next concentric circle basically fellowship of the link ogm that sort of thing and uh, we'd love you because i mean the we're working on these dimensions for describing uh, tools for thought in order the dimensions of the map and i boiled those down from three separate documents all of which I got through Fellowship of the Link. There was Bentley's document. There was Marc Antoine's document. There was a third one I found on Twitter, in fact, of different ways of measuring that. So just boiling them down, bringing them back to 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 you to expand uh, and to continue that discussion whilst we work in parallel on other aspects of the project. Uh, apart from that, um, still ill, but getting better. Um, Finally took the plunge into Mastodon at three o'clock in the morning and been, I've written a couple of posts uh, on that and what it means for my work in the what we call the Brussels bubble and how to make sure that the, the Brussels bubble doesn't sort of stay a little echo chamber now within the 30 verse because it's a bit of an echo chamber on Facebook and an echo chamber on Twitter. It'd be nice for it to us to avoid doing that in on the 30 verse. Um, pull, pulled out of the pkg book um over the last few days um uh i know that um francine and chris are, are working on their chapters but you're going to see my chapter coming out in a series of blog posts in the in the coming months um <coughs> so yeah i've got quite a lot on and work on the european commission same as same as basically but yeah chugging along nice to see you all again yeah likewise same here And you said uh, you're uh, muted. An, an, an X bubble, and I didn't get the turn. Oh, maybe is that better? Yeah. No. Yep. I always have issues with. Uh, I don't know. Is it working? It's tap tap. Okay. Yes, we hear you. Um, I saw an e- your email a week or so ago, Matthew, and I'm sorry I had a chance to respond to it. But I, I had the same issue I think you did, and we discussed it a few weeks ago on the uh, uh, the Knowledge Graph book. But mm-hmm. I, you know, like you, I am also not there in part because of the really abysmal contract uh, <laughs> language that they push. So. That was one of my reasons. The, the other reason is that we're talking about two different things for two different audiences. They, they, they have a hammer and they, and they want to make a book about nails, basically. 
Yeah. And, and that's fine. The, the world needs a book about nails, but I, I, I can't really contribute that much to the book. So, <laughs> yeah. Well, I, their initial contract was just so abysmally bad. Like, I, you know. Did they guarantee you, you a payment of zero euros? Because that's what they guaranteed me. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. In fact, actually, it, it almost read as if I was going to be paying them. Yeah. You know, they they I, admitted that that's what was going to happen, that they needed to revise the contract, because otherwise any changes I made that they would have to implement, they would bill me. Yeah. I just say I'm not. I'm sorry. I'm not paying you for. I, I, if I want to vanity publish my book, I can do that without your help. <laughs> so, and I haven't never. I never got a revised contract, so they're not well organized either. Yeah, I. It's always a lot, but we can move on from there. Um. Um, anything else going on in your world? Too much. Um, and I'm not sure how much I I'm watching a lot of the indie web space as Mastodon is having its moment for a few minutes. Um, but I'm also watching a lot of people make the same mistakes of buying heavily into Mastodon the same way they had bought into Twitter before, and they're going to repeat the same cycle. So the part of, Part of the question is, what are you doing and why and what do you expect to get out of it and what kind of affordances, um, which, you know, impacts directly, I think, a lot of the things we talk about. Um, and, you know, people like Flancian have, a, I think, a better perspective and more tools to make this a possibility for themselves. But the rest of the masses, I think, are still kind of missing they just want a, a free space and we need more than just a free space or what they think is a free space. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm watching some of the social patterns that are emerging out of it. It's also interesting how big of a hiccup picking a server and sort of figuring out some of the Mastodonish stuff has been for the masses of people trying to find an alternative to Twitter. Yeah. Although I have seen one or two people starting to frame it as Mastodon has all these fabulous affordances and it's going to be a while before Twitter can catch up with it in terms of functionality and freedom and flexibility. So I, it's interesting to see things like that pop up. Um, I literally published an hour ago a blog post called Am I on the right Mastodon instance? That was like, like the subject of my second of my second post about Mastodon. I, I'm literally posting about me as I'm discovering it as I go, you know, because I'm not an expert. And I'm just trying to figure it out like everybody else. Not like everybody else, like all the other Twitter migration newbies. But I put the link in chat in case you want to check it out. I literally just, you're the first people to hear about it. It just went live. But it's, you know, it's interesting. Um, it's actually a collective intelligence tool. The, the the people on your on your server are essentially your content discovery algorithm as you get started, and that's sort of pretty cool. Awesome. Um, yeah, and, and and Chris, I wanted to ask you something uh, on uh, you mentioned the issue with signups and so on. An idea got into my head last week, uh, and I don't remember if it was because you said it, but the heroes. That we need like something like a sign up router where you could where users could say this is the uh, username I want, and then the router will say these are all the instances that have the username available and what they are about. Sort of like to replicate to, to sort of like turn the sign up processing on its head. And you know, did you say this? That it was better if, if users first chose the username and then the instance? I think the bigger problem isn't so much the, the username is usually an easy thing. The bigger mm -hmm. problem is which instance of yeah. the now more than 3,000, you know, is going to reflect and align with my values of what kind of moderation am I looking for, lack of moderation. Do I want all Nazis? Do I want no Nazis? Do I want... Yes. You know, and there's 77 
different variables that fit into that decision. Yeah, something, something and there are, like I, don't, I don't think there are any tools at all to help people other than asking my friends who've been there for four or five years. But even at that, there are now in the last week or two weeks, I think there are now a thousand more instances, a thousand plus I counted the other day and, or did a quick check. There's now a thousand new instances that you potentially could join. In fact, somebody, uh, I think mentioned a few that have popped up that I've noticed, uh, late Friday, um, within the tools for thought space, including another, there's another one that somebody's registered zettelkasten.social as a Mastodon instance. It just isn't, or it wasn't live the last time I checked, but presumably that will pop up in days and be an option as well. So, you know, I'm waiting for my local library or my local newspaper to set up their own instance for, you know, nearby people in the community. Um, Internet sense. Archive did kind of that. They, they did it for staff and role accounts at Internet yeah. Archive. I thought that was interesting. I've seen, I think I saw one for one European government set up a, an instance for government workers. Uh, MIT, I think, has one for MIT people. You, you, Chris, you may have seen me saying that that's what the European Commission should do with its server, which oh, no, no, I, but I think I thought ago. about they should do it, and I couldn't find yeah. which country it was. But there I is a Germany probably country, uh, probably in Germany, that has set one up specifically for. I don't think it was a city level. I think it was a government cabinet level something, um, which I thought was interesting. I have seen one tool that will look for instances close to your geographical region. So if you're in the Netherlands, you can use this thing and find a, a server that's in the Netherlands that ostensibly might serve the Netherlands. Um, I'm aware of a handful of language based servers. There's one called uh, toot.wales for Welsh speakers, although I probably about half of it is written in English. Um, and I know there's one or two in Scots and uh, Irish, which are interesting. So it's it's fun to see these things kind of flourish and go somewhere. But, you know, I think there's still some missing pieces that and, I'll, you know, a lot still a lot of work to to make this what everybody would ideally like it to be. I'm sort of surprised there are that few instances of Mastodon, given how this exodus is not that young anymore. And there's lots of people trying to find a road away from Twitter. So 7,000 7, instances of Mastodon doesn't seem like that many if this is a distributed community oriented infrastructural thing. But most people will, what they'll do is they'll use, what, what is the tool? I mentioned it in, in my post, you know, they'll use the tool to find out where most of their Twitter friends are. And that will almost always be mastodon.social. It's a, it's a power law. And, or there might be one server which happens to correspond to their particular in, area of interest. And that would be like the second place. And they'll just go to one of those two. And the big ones will get bigger. And there'll be consolidation, I guess, at one point. But the whole point is to have be in a, a nice small space where the moderation is local. You know your moderator, you know, should be tailored to your interest and so forth. And yeah, anyway, there's, it, it's going to be really interesting to see how this how this shakes out. Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> sorry. It's kind of a myself. test of the uh, Indieverse, Fediverse, et cetera, IndieWeb Fediverse. It's also a test of how many, how much people are expect, uh, are prepared, how many people are prepared to spend a couple of bucks a month to have a voice when before they were used to paying with their privacy. You know, uh, it's hard enough to get people to pay for content. Even a few years ago, it was almost impossible. It's become a bit more normal to get people to pay for content. Now we're asking to pay for infrastructure, and I don't know how many people are going to do that, but I hope I hope a lot will. I, I'm going to. Yeah, perhaps it's going to be a distribution like the uh, 991 rule, uh, just because like uh, the people who can pay can probably pay for a few hundred users, infrastructure costs. Um, yes, hopefully, I think it probably responds to that. Like, uh, social Cop has like a donation suggested, uh, but only about a third of the users contribute, and still we have like plenty. 
I think the weird thing too is if you go back to it was probably it started in 2016 so most of the articles i think were march 2017 when mastodon kind of first hit mm. mainstream press and if you go back and look at some of those articles that list a handful of the bigger servers i think they mentioned there was one article i looked at that mentioned six different servers and of those i think only two still exist the others have since shut down and disappeared and did so in a time when you couldn't move any of your data over. So I, I worry that there are a lot of small instances popping up that are well-meaning, like this PKM instance. You know, it's lovely and it's great. And maybe it stays small enough and can be financially viable enough. But if the one or two people who are paying for it and putting it out there aren't getting enough help or it becomes a burden or an administrative burden, then it goes down and the 20 or 30 people who are there go down with it. Uh, maybe they move somewhere else, but it's going to be a lot more data disappearing yeah. because you can't take your posts with you. Um, so I'm, you know, ever the indie web enthusiast, I always post everything to my site first even if it's private and then syndicate a copy so that when this place disappears, you know, I've got, I've got the material, but it, you know, almost nobody else is doing that or worried about it or even thinking about it as a thing. And how are you archiving your own site? Yeah. Well, I archive it on my own site locally and then I have a couple backups further to that as well. So, um, but it's, you know, a lot of people may just use it for purely social reasons and they're throwing ideas out into the ether and, you know, you, you put them in the trash can and they disappear. But the interesting thing I've seen is there are people liking and boosting and, you know, retooting things I posted almost a year ago on Mastodon that they've dug in and found. So it's, and I... I have seen that more than I have ever seen on Twitter. Nobody goes into the deep Twitter archives unless you do a targeted search for a word and you find, happen to find a tweet. But I'm people are digging way back into my Twitter or my uh, Mastodon instance to find things from over a year ago. Um, and it's not like you're scrolling 50, you know, 50 posts to get that far. You're you're scrolling a lot to get that far back. Um, and are these posts not searchable through Google? Is Google searching them so they could find their way directly to a post? I mean, couldn't that be happening? I don't know. I have no idea how. I haven't looked into how Google's indexing or not indexing. Right. Um, my, I, my main instance is mastodon.social, which is about as open and flexible as they come, I think. Um, but, you know, my primary instance is actually my WordPress website, which acts as or looks like its own instance. So I'm one of the few Mastodon users that has over 16,000 posts. Um, and I think there's a lot of people in the Fediverse with that much content yet. Mm -hmm. Although, give it a week. <laughs> Um, do we want to go back to the mapping tools project topic? Do we want to see on Mastodon? Do we want to go to something else? I would love to talk about the mapping tools project because it's quite late. And my wife, when I told my wife I'd be going coming back for a second meeting after after dinner, after meeting P Peter and the others, uh, Peter and Bill about Massive Wiki, she wasn't that impressed. So I'd like to. I'd probably want to stick around for a little longer if that's okay by you. Sure. <coughs> But um, yeah, I mean, we were talking about it at the beginning um, that um, we are working on the dimensions. I think Pete showed you guys that. And um, we were wondering, um, I don't know quite when we'll be ready, but we'd like to invite anybody who's interested to help us work on the dimensions a bit further. Um, how much interest is there in, in this group? I mean, I, I'm assuming that you all know what we're, what we're talking about already. I wasn't there last week, but Pete, I think, mentioned it. Um, I'm interested in, we'll 
join you in the conversation. So should we just take an agenda point next week? Cause we're not quite ready yet. Or should we have a dedicated meeting some other time during the week? Feels like just joining the flow of your meetings would be fine. Unless somebody thinks differently. Peter, what do you think? Um, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't know that I have a big preference. Um, I, I do like, a, I, I like the idea of a focused meeting. Um, but the funny thing is our, uh, the project meetings are, are kind of overlaid on top of massive wiki Wednesday right now, which is fine. I'm not <laughs> complaining. Um, but then, but maybe that's the thing. Uh, I, maybe that actually works out better for you, Matthew. Uh, we could do next Wednesday, uh, two hours earlier than the fellowship call. Um, Perfect for me. Things. Yeah. I think that's, that, that sounds great. Okay. So anybody wants to join us two hours before this meeting, um, <coughs> the massive wiki channel, we'll post uh, the link and, um, <coughs> and the link on, the, on the fellowship uh, channel. Peter, better you answer all questions. I'm <laughs> coughing too much. Um, what are the what other steps, if any, did you guys think through for the mapping project, or is that just something to catch up with on the call? Um, there's a uh, uh, there's a I I think well I I know I've shared it here. Um, uh, we don't have a real domain yet, so DT. Um, I have to remember <laughs> it's a weird, funny domain. Um, you can use a Google link. Uh, so there's already a, a project plan and an about page that says a lot about what we saw. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I feel like things aren't coalesced very well, uh, so you kind of have to poke around and see what's going on, but. Uh, we have a pretty good idea of what we want to do. Um, uh, and I could talk about it, but y'all could read about it too, and that's probably better. Basically, we want to like we want to make progress on two fronts in parallel. On the one hand, working on the dimensions so that once we get the fellowship of the link, um, but we, once we get your inputs, because a lot of you gave me inputs to come up with the first set of dimensions. Um, We'll work on that in parallel whilst we're also working on the code and the content and everything so that um once the, we we've agreed as a group what the dimensions look like we can actually release this to version two which is where we actually bring it out to a, uh, the next concentric circle outwards um and ask for people to start actually providing content and get this thing rolling and seeing how much traction we get um, so yeah, better than better to do two things in parallel rather than doing it sequentially. Otherwise, it would take too long. Um, Matthew, you think it's okay to to post the HackMD um, from this morning? Yeah, sure. Um, let me do that real quick. Um, so. Um, So this is, it, it's not, uh, uh, it's not complete at all. This was uh, like literally three, three or four minutes uh, this morning. Um, but we're next, I think the very next phase is to explain to ourselves uh, a little bit more what we're trying to accomplish and condense the project plan and the about page, uh, maybe some uh, blog posts here from here and there um, into a couple paragraphs. Here's what we're trying to accomplish. So. Um, I'm also reminded, um, Matthew, there's a, a CTA um, uh, archive of thinking tools and their dimensions or something like that that we need to um, absorb. Uh, CTA? 
uh, Collaborative Tools, Collaborative Technology Alliance. Um, okay. Yet, yeah, right. yet another, you know. Yet another. Great. Okay. Um, if you, I'll, I'll see if I can dig something out. But um, I think we've got a okay. reasonably good start um, on the air yeah. table now. We need to sort of continue. And uh, between now and next week, maybe we should have another look at how we're going to get people to contribute their, their thoughts to directly into Airtable or in, in some sort of parallel document. Um, uh, since, since we ended up talking about Mastodon uh, a little bit earlier, um, it, it occurs to me that the same process that we're doing for thinking tools, um, uh, we can learn a lot about how to build something similar for Mastodon instances. Hmm. which would be a much bigger project, um, much more exciting in both good and bad ways. But and another idea kicking around is to do pattern languages because I really want to dive into that one day. So and, and you, I, I just said that because I wanted to see Jerry do his thing with his hands. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm too, too predictable sometimes. <laughs> no, it's lovely. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm really interested in sort of the meta pattern language idea of how do we take a lot of this already distilled wisdom and hook it up so that it's more useful, more visible, more findable, all those things. That'd be great. <laughs> Including just simple decision trees and stuff. I mean, just, just for example, um, we don't have any big screen TVs or anything like that. And so this holiday season, we looked at each other and thought, well, it'd be nice to get a slightly bigger screen, nothing monstrous, like 43 inch. The decision tree for buying home entertainment systems, I have not found. And, and because you could rapidly end up buying like all sorts of just crazy technology and a separate sound system that costs as much as your panel and this and that and the other. And like, how do you decide what, you know, which, which is it Roku or Google TV? What, what? It's it's massively complicated. It's more complicated than when I bought my Apple II Plus many years ago, which was a geeky, geeky purchase. Um, and so, I, why why hasn't since so many people are interested in more people buying these things, why hasn't anybody put up a good like infrastructure support thing for it? So the more the more freedom and flexibility you have in choices the harder and more complex your choices become. And the problem is all those choices on that decision tree are provided by 50 different companies, none of which service all of the choices. And it's so it's, and unless they can win on all the points, they're not going to create the decision tree that indicates by Sony top to bottom or by Apple top to bottom that now, your choice becomes a whole lot easier if you just say, I'm going to buy the Sony system or the Apple system. Right. And then you'll know everything works together, at least as a bare minimum. But there's too much choice. And even, let's say, CNET.com doesn't get enough clicks to make it worth collecting all those things, testing all those things, putting them together and making that tree. And five minutes after they make that tree, it's obsolete. And I, I I went on on I've forgotten whose advice I went and signed up for Consumer Reports, which I haven't been using for ages, but it's forty bucks a year, and they've got a bunch of stuff on TVs. And I went into the like the TV section, and uh, there is not simple filters, simple ways to like slice and dice the data are missing. I'm like, oh, this is not useful. But but with a Consumer Reports thing, uh, you should be able to reverse engineer their decision tree essentially, um, and Maybe. and and plus Wirecutter instead of Consumer Reports. Especially, I went to Wirecutter that wasn't that helpful because they're so simple that they have like A, B, or C, and and like ooh, this is a more complicated decision than good, better, best, right? Um, or uh, sorry, uh, Chris then Flancian. Chris, if you want to unmute and jump in. Are you hearing us? No. Oh, oh okay. your hand is up. Yeah, so. I can hear you. I, no, I, oh, I have your, no idea how that happened. Your hand is up accidentally. Flancian, I believe, put his up intentionally. Let's go there. Yeah. So yeah. Um, on the decision trees and why they don't exist, I think I, the maintenance and uh, relative maintenance, um, Cost is, is high, uh, but just mean they won't be useful. I agree. But also, there's no uh, they, currently uh, the incentives are not aligned. I think 
I, I, feel, I think of this very often, Jerry, when, you know, I do a, like a Google search or like a YouTube search, and then you're like, I have an activity in mind, like buying eggs. And then it's like, click a link, it's useless. Click a link, it's useless. Click a link, oh, this one is useful. And the next user will have to do the same thing. Right. That looks like a tree, that, that navigation path is not informed in, in any way to any other user. Uh, although it is informed to the company um, who provides the search uh, service. So uh, that's uh, probably why it's that she can be built very easily. Um, browser school definitely have like even ext an extension could do this. Like this is what I want to achieve right now. So please use all the data I produce in the context of informing what this actual tree should look like for the future user. But mm -hmm. we, and, and to some extent, the, this data could be crowdsourced, but we don't do it. Exactly. And yeah. there's there's a neighboring function to the decision tree for name your space, buying an electric vehicle, buying a TV, buying a whatever. There's a neighboring space, which is the family tree of the products. Like, oh, you know, in 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 1985, they did a major redesign of this motorcycle. So all the models after it are much, much better than anything before 1985. That should be like, like that should leap out at you in some kind mm -hmm. of product tree. And then you should be able to slice across and see the contemporary models from competing products to that particular model and say, well, in this year, Yamaha did this, Honda did this, and here, you know, here's the slice. So that's your, that's your buying set for that moment. Nowhere, nothing. And I, I would think that Amazon would benefit from this, but but obscurity makes for more merchants, I think. I think that, that confusion in the marketplace means more people show up yes. and try to sell stuff and more people try to buy stuff and more stuff gets bought and sold anyway. I yeah, don't know. Sort of by recent, essentially, for products. Yeah. So that way, like products that come out uh, like uh, last, they are bought by default. So yeah. This, uh, perpetual, That's yeah, right. Hunch.com. Hunch Thank you. That was Katarina Fake. I was, I've got it for down for 2009. I should contact Katerina and see what yeah, happens. Yeah, ask Katerina what she thinks these days. Yeah. I, they, I remember um, a little bit about how the, the technology worked. They, they created a, they built up a thumbnail of your context as a querier and uh, available context about what was out there. And I think they invested, they invested a bit too much in trying to satisfy the the querier rather like they were not as, as interested in some underlying knowledge about the world mm -hmm. but if they had been there are obviously ways to get the producers as part of producing you, know, you, you have to produce documentation about your thing you're producing print manuals that you ship with it you're, you're you have a, a tech spec for engineers and so on if, if people made a version of that that spoke the language of decision trees a lot of this would be easier. And instead they were relying on people, enough people being interested in the topic to fill out questionnaires, to go through the tree and sort of the, the pachinko process of choosing where you end up would help them build this inferred model. The A big problem too is the, the lack of information parity. So what you want exists, Jerry, but but you need to be an Amazon senior executive to look at the compiled data. So to some extent, you could go to Amazon and look at what's the recommended Amazon basics version of a lot of products. And those will be the things that Amazon and in their infinite wisdom decided were selling through all their other third parties but that we're selling so well, we can go straight to China, take over the factory that's making them for all these small party sellers. We'll buy it all up so they can no longer sell it and or we'll cut the margin because we can and then sell the, the most popular product that everybody's already buying. Yeah, But I, you're I mean, also they, they, then missing yeah, out sure. who's the... Who's the... Uh, what is the bleeding edge buying? What did Flancian buy last week in, you know, the, the social space? Because that's going to be the thing that's going to be big five years from now. Um, I, I also noticed um, a couple of things uh, years ago. Um, it behooves no vendor of stuff to be easily compared to anybody else. So you need to create some kind of way to say, I'm not the same. I'm not the same. Don't even consider me in the same basket. And that might mean you change your warranty terms. It might mean you do something else. Uh, so that's that's one angle. 
uh, because the, like each vendor is trying to not be compared because they'll mostly lose. Uh, and then the other thing is, for some reason, makers of modern vacuums which are way more expensive than they ought to be, have all decided to do ergonomics and usability as like last on their list. And the switches to turn these freaking things on and off are, are hidden. There's like, I'm like, how did vacuums get stupider over time? Um, and, and, and user interfaces are such a major and important criterion, purchase criterion. It's like when you buy a uh, back in the day when we sort of bought a, a, a radio slash whatever for your car, like what the UI was would be should be really important, but was barely considered by anybody any place. Uh, and it's like, ah, man, these it's just buying stuff. And you'd think that commerce would have so many people interested. And I was just reading an article about how TikTok has become like this advertising mecca where lots of people are selling stuff on TikTok and TikTok is doing really well even as Facebook and Twitter and everybody else have all these layoffs. Anyway, sorry for the long digression into just uh, filthy lucre and commerce, but it sort of fits alongside our you know, decision uh, dimensions and so forth for evaluating software and comparing software because like these are all problems that are like right next to each other that aren't right. being solved elegantly by, by, by anybody as far as I can tell. And a lot of these they all look like coordination problems, like like so many problems, right? Uh, so this is like I, I mean, yes, I, I wrote it in the chat, but it's like quickly. Um, uh, so we have naturalized, like uh, as as consumers, I guess that companies are gonna like siphon our data and browsing history and actually use them for like a profit, like you know, crazy detail, the Amazon case. And uh, you know, of course, like there's a group of people that just reel against this and say like, oh, we shouldn't do that, we shouldn't contribute the data. I say maybe let's just contribute the data to more sources so why not why not save a copy of that data uh i will definitely like opt-in into like sharing all like, my amazon all e-commerce related queries search queries all that i will put in the commons like tomorrow and then you know if like a million people do the same we will have like a pretty okay data set to begin with mm -hmm. Uh, this is uh, segues into like what I think uh, Moa Party or like cross bolsters, and in general that that area you know in the failures uh, has potential to actually unlock. It's the part of that problem though too is how good is the data? So it's a big issue in the podcasting space. You go it, you know Apple iTunes is driving most of the growth, even though they don't care about the space at all. But every podcaster will say, rate us and review us on iTunes because that's what drives growth. But then, then you get all these people sending social signals, hey, this is the best podcast ever, and they've listened to one episode. Better is, you know, so, and for that reason, I post, I don't do it as often now, but the stuff that I listen to on podcasts I'll post every individual episode. So when I say, hey, this podcast is good, you can look back and see how often is he actually listening to it? Does he listen every day, every week? Does he listen to all the episodes? Is he a completist? Because the signal of the time I've spent physically invested into that is a way stronger signal of is this good or not? You know, I, everybody can say, yeah, The Mandalorian is great, but I have no idea of how many people actually really spent all their time and watched every single episode as an indicator of how good is that? I have no idea, you know, I, but if I watch social media, I get the impression that it must be awesome because I hear about it all the time, but I don't see the actual aggregate numbers. Disney plus doesn't say this is how many hours people spent watching this thing. And I want that data. That's the data I want, but they're never going to give it to me. So we can crowdsource it, maybe. That it cannot be taken away very easily. Uh, I sorry, I, I wanted to say something. Um, I I have I may have to leave in five minutes, and I wanted to do uh, a quick check-in uh, because I have something that I think you could be interesting uh, interested in, which is that. Um, and then uh, I'm happy to resume the other thread until uh, I leave. Um, uh, so I attended on Sunday, thanks to uh, Samuel, thank you for inviting me, this amazing workshop uh, called Synthesis Infrastructures Workshop. 
And uh, there is one link that was produced as, as you know during the workshop. I mean, one link, one site that was like maintaining a wiki, uh, Synthesis Infrastructures Wiki, which I've linked in the notes. Uh, let me just copy and paste into the chat. Uh, which I think was really, uh, <laughs> thank you, Chris. That was really well organized. And like it's, it has it had a lot of overlap with uh, the feature of the link, I thought. There were people from all over the world, like many different universities. I thought it was like an amazing, amazing um, like group. And um, I wanted to say also that uh, I saw that massive wiki was mentioned as one of the tools in the space. So I, I thought you will want to be aware, Peter, you learned about this. Uh, it was covered in at least one session. I was lucky because I got there on Sunday uh, when I saw the message. Thank you, Samuel, again. And like I got there just for the synthesis stage of all the breakout groups. And so it was like getting like an upload of the whole conference, like in like uh, two, three hours. Uh, it was really good. Uh, so I took notes, of course, um, in the Agora. Uh, but the, the wiki itself is like a, a, a very good resource. And there was one, uh, there were the different groups, like I said, uh, and one was focused around um, um, discourse graphs, which I think, you know, the, well, we don't have Mark Antoine here, but, you know, the Canonical Daily Lab is very focused on, and uh, also on like social media, uh, and yes, uh, on like projects that, you know, that aggregate and like uh, that, are, you know, that I would call Agora like or like uh, Massive Weekly like and so on. And uh, yes. So I guess I, I want to share that because I thought it was like, a, you know, really good, like an amazing, like, you know, signal. Um, and there's probably going to be a, some uh, upcoming activities related. I mentioned the fellowship of the link as a related group. Uh, so and I may talk to some people there. Uh, apparently, there's going to be some follow up. So, yes, I will uh, I may invite a few folks. Cool. And that was part of the CS computer supported collaborative work workshop event uh, i think uh, it's actually i don't know uh, that's what it says on the, on the page you shared it says this it is does? Yes, CSCW, it is. <laughs> which is astonishing to me because i went to one cscw meeting oh i don't know 1999 or something like that mm -hmm. it was ages yeah. ago nice <laughs> cool i'm i'm glad they're still around yeah and um yes least of a least of them to have this course <laughs> that's great um, yes, I know. I thank you for the anniversary. Yes, I did. I didn't. I wasn't able to do anything for the anniversary of the but you know, uh, there's time. So yes, I, I put in my uh, checking. Uh, you know what I plan to do in the in next few weeks. Um, and yes, I think we're gonna sing with Peter on like uh, Massive Wiki and Agora, uh, hopefully next week as well. So we may, we will share notes. That sounds great. Yeah. So yeah, that was uh, that was the one thing because you know. And then the race is like, uh, you know, like the favors and so all uh, everything we discussed, there's a lot of activity there. And like a lot of people also uh, stepped up and like want to contribute to like MOA, for example, which is a cross poster, you know, that uh, sometimes doesn't, break, doesn't, doesn't work for Matthew very well now, but it mostly works. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I mean, there's just like, it's, it's very nice to see uh, that, you know, have really like a fraction of people that jump to the favors want to contribute. So the, again, the 1991 uh, rule in action and like, uh, or like just rule of thumb. Uh, yeah, so it was it's just very nice to see like this project with uh, attention and people just jumping to like collaborate. Uh, yes. Uh, so that's that's for me. Um, thanks, Lancien. And I guess you've got to go. And Matthew, we should probably send you to your better half. Uh, so, that family, much. so that family, Good family, you family can be preserved. Nice to see you. <laughs> see you next Wednesday, as John Landis would have it. Excellent. See you guys. Thank Bye. you. Um, uh, SJ, did you want to check in at all? Do you want to? I'm just curious what's been hot for you or on your radar. Uh, well, uh, this discourse graph business, I've, I've spent, I've worked on a bit the last couple of weeks. We've been thinking about how to start a, like the, the researchers who are doing it now, they already have one or two pub pubs for their research group. They've been publishing research on uh, initially sort of evaluating current generation note-taking tools as a way to structure knowledge and then figuring out how to make, if they can come up with a um, a standard format for um, related work for, for scientific publications. Like how, how could they convince the scientists that they know to publish, to, to make an explicit skeleton of the axioms and arguments and conclusions 
um, that's just more structured than their conclusions section and make it normal for that to be its own thing with an identifier that people can point to with the idea that once you have a few thousand of those, then you can start asking, are these well enough aligned that you can build composite graphs or meaningfully say, here is the umbrella discourse graph for you know the optimal um, the optimal design for an aluminum can, or you know here here's the here's the umbrella of um, approaches to carbon sequestration that you know, like are cheapest within their domain. And um, they're reasonably ambitious, given that they only have a, a couple hundred um, eight, they have a couple hundred like Rome instances that they've been using and that's it. But uh, they they want to expand the definition of what the thing they mean to include past examples. So anyone, I think, it, to the extent that any of you have tackled argument mapping or discourse mapping at some point in the past or tried to explicitly uh, cluster and de declare vocabularies of axioms in some field or um, assertions and counter and, and rebuttals made by a bunch of people who are all talking about the same thing. Uh, I'd love to hear about it. They would love to hear about it. I can probably connect you to people who are thinking about, they have PhD students and they're figuring out if they can articulate um, multi-year research projects. And I, I think the, the, the intended out, outcome is a, is a healthy one. It's like the, the idea that one of the things you should be publishing by definition, should be anchoring itself in other people's articulation of the elements of your of, of the thing you're doing is sort of nice. And there's even some connection between the spirit of that and the spirit of this sort of hunch map of the like the, the, the state of play of a decision tree. This is this is you have the decision trees and you have the argument trees. But one of the things that they all share is you have to find a way to decide when two people are talking about the same thing. Right? Constant recurrence in in um, the fellowship. Um, thank you. Th uh, three quick things. One, too bad Marc Antoine isn't on this call because he, I think this would be right up his alley. Um, second, do you know Jamie Joyce of Society Library? I don't. Um, because I think that some of the stuff that they're doing, which is more toward debate and things like that, might actually fit uh, in what you're talking about. Um, and then the third is this Forby company. Has everybody, anybody else met Sam Shikowitz? Um, he approached me and we had a nice chat. Uh, Forby is a decision-making uh, tool that's like for communities and other sorts of things. Bentley, thanks for putting the Society Library link in there. Um, Jamie is also a regular on the Canonical Debate Lab conversations that Bentley is in, that Marc Antoine is in, <clears throat> which might be interesting to you. I don't know. Um, but, um, oh, that's right. Uh, but Sam is sort of experimenting with uh, decision making interfaces and uh, runs pretty deep on this. So he might be interesting as well. That's great. I will change the link that I've got attached to it in my brain now from .org to .io. Um, and, and, and I'm, I was going to say bedeviled, but I, I keep struggling with how to explain this shared thinking space, like what to call it and any riffs or ideas or insights on that are always, always, always welcome. My, <laughs> yay. You Too mean our shared thinking space? Yeah. The fellowship? Uh, well, I don't mean uh, the conversational space or the Zoom space. I mean um, how how and where we would put notes together so that they're visible in some shared arena, as opposed to uh, links in a chat next to our little rectangles. Um, well, you know my <laughs> my proposal right now. <laughs> so I will say anagora and amasiwiki. And, and I think that's a, that's a really good starting place for these experiments. Yeah. And that's why I want to catch up with you on the calls uh, and sort of go back to that. I mean, again, if we, if we can define repositories that we want to put into this, uh, into the big fungus, essentially, 
uh, I think from we can go from that to the instance uh, rather quickly. Uh, but uh, you know, if not, uh, perhaps we need to finish the thinking tools map first. I don't know. We can do both at the same time. Yeah. Um, and mm -hmm. thanks for mentioning the big fungus, which is my best approximation to trying to explain this phenomenon. Um, I would love to help publish any preprints that people have of, of research. I think there are a lot of audiences like CSCW where there'd be interested readers, maybe even collaborators, but they, their unit of communication